now let me introduce our first presenter, Mary Beth Mann, a photographer from Rhode Island. Mary Beth is an independent, independent photographer, writer, and educator who spent more than 20 years embedding in herself in communities across the United States, beginning in her native New England and continuing in the Midwest, South, and in Silicon Valley, her work combines images, text, and large-scale public installation and stems from her belief in collaborative processes that should function in and for the community it reflects. The work Mary Beth will present tonight is her most recent project featured on the front page of the New York Times this past January, Seen Noonan. Hey, Mary Beth. Hi, everybody. Hey, uh, my stomach just clenched up. It's funny, you get nerves no matter what, even at home. <laughs> nice to see you all. Um, it's great to see your faces. Uh, I was thrilled when Glenn said that even though we were doing this online, that so many people signed up. So I hope you're all doing well and that your families are safe and healthy. And I'm just really honored that everyone wants to take their evening and, and talk together. So I really appreciate it. Um, I am going to switch right over into, um, hang on, I'm sorry, right over into screen sharing mode and talk. And Glenn, you're, you're going to just deal with the muting and the unmuting and the moderating, right? So I don't have to worry about questions? Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to talk for a little while and then I hope we get to um, do some questions. So hang on a sec. Share screen. Share. Can you see my screen? You slideshow. Okay. So um, I wanted to start with some pictures from Brockton, Mass, because um, I first started doing these installations in my hometown of Brockton, and it was after having children and going back to photography after a big break that I realized um, I wanted to do a deep project about my hometown. And the thing that really grabbed me about my hometown was how much I loved it. I, I grew up there and I loved the people there and I loved my experience there. It was a working class ethnic community. A lot of you are from New England, you know about cities, gateway cities like Brockton, immigrant communities. And yet when I left, as the years went by, I heard such negative narratives about it. And those narratives were most often centered around economics and race. So to put it bluntly, the old Irish guys, like my dad and my best friend's dad here at the pool where I grew up swimming, and the Italians um, would say things like, these new immigrants have ruined my city. Uh, the blacks have ruined my city. Brockton has become a third world country. And they couldn't see a connection between their Irish and Italian ancestors and the new Haitian and Cape Verdean immigrants who were having a go of it in Brockton. So I went back there after I had kids and I looked first at the people I knew growing, growing up. This is Mrs. Mathers, who was an older Irish American woman. And then I used my sort of journalistic skills before, um, Going back to Brockton, I, I had gone to journalism school, photojournalism school in Missouri. I'd come out and worked as a stringer for the New York Times in the 90s. Thea Bright, who's here, I think, gave me my first job at the Providence Journal in 95. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. And then I went and took the 10-year nap and got married and had Ted ki two kids. And I thought my career was sort of in the basement. And then I, as I came out, my kids got a little older, I came back to this Brockton work. So I had kind of journalistic um, experience to be able to go into the new communities of Brockton. This is um, Melissa Cruz, she was Dominican. This is Kumbal Benaga, he was from um, Guinea-Bissau. And really try to make a humane portrait of what the place was. And it was during that time that, um, I was sitting with someone in Brockton who was helping get to get funding for my work through the Mass Cultural Council. We were looking at this abandoned supermarket and we were thinking about perceptions of places like Brockton, just like my old uncles are looking at the newcomers and thinking they know what they see. I always knew that outsiders looked at 
Brockton as kind of a dump and a place that only drug dealers and criminals came from. And I thought, if I take this work and I show it out in the world, that will be good for me, but what will it do for Brockton? And I was sitting with a woman having coffee near this old abandoned grocery store and thinking, wouldn't it be amazing to wrap this old grocery store in photos invite people to come and see the work here so that they have to really interact with the space and the people while looking at the pictures. So we approached the mayor and she said, well, this is in 20, this is in 2010. And she said, well, you can't have that grocery store, but you can use downtown. So this is how it started was for these installations. And I'm sure you know the work of JR. You know, I got really just excited about what happens when you take a picture of an ordinary person and make it on a celebrity scale and put it in a landscape. Now, I wanna say that everything I've learned about doing this work in the last 10 years, oh, let's see, 2011, almost 10 years, has happened to me gradually. I didn't know how the work would be received. I didn't understand the impact it would have. I didn't know how it would make people feel, but I had kind of a gut feeling that, um, that it was a good thing to do. So at the time, this was my biggest banner. This, is, this was 16 feet wide, and this is in 2011. This is Mr. DeGrasa over here is from Cape Verde, and this is uh, Luigi Michelle, she's from Haiti, and this is Mrs. Mathers over here, and so I wanted to start with the old guard, this is Main Street, Brockton, and then I'm half Irish and half Italian, and someone said the Cape Verdeans and Haitians are the Irish and Italians of this century, and so I wanted to begin the installation by honoring those two groups. There's Mrs. Mathers. And there's Kumbal on the path to City Hall. And what I quickly realized was that the community became really engaged. This is Mrs. Nezrella, who was an old friend of my mother's, who gave me a building to put a banner on. And she, you know, she wasn't invested in what the picture was gonna say, what was it representing. All she said was, you can do whatever you want with my building, honey, because she was invested in the project, getting people downtown to care about Brockton. So we have walking tours. I think Thea Bright's in this picture somewhere. And people came and for a whole year they came. They came from New York, they came from Maine, they came from Brown, they came from sociology departments, anthropology, documentary studies, history. They talked about immigration, who belongs where, how have the immigrants of Brockton changed, what are the connections between the old Irish immigrant and the guy from Guinea-Bissau. And these conversations happened every weekend for a year. So that was my first kind of entree into that work. The work was sort of more of a documentary style. Then after a couple of projects in New Bedford and Fall River, I got kind of exhausted and I just decided I'm gonna come back to Providence. I'm gonna walk around my neighborhood, drive my car to different neighborhoods and explore the form of portraiture. I'd never really done portraiture before, um, straight portraiture. And so I, started making portraits in my neighborhood. And my husband reminded me, this is also for Thea, this is a picture. I had a photo column in the Providence Journal in the 90s for five years, once a week, I would make a photo of something that was not part of the news and write about it. And I was really then exploring this thing called the third effect the relationship between an image and words and how when you put them together, you create this new reality to create tension between them, you get to confirm some things and you complicate some things. Uh, and so this is, Thea Bright made this happen that I could have this space every week in the journal. And my husband said, you know, there's this thing called the internet now. You could start writing again. Hi everybody. And so, sorry? Hey Beth. Yeah. Hi Thea. <laughs> Hi. So I started this blog and the, the, back in the then it was called Seen and Unseen. Now it's called Reseeing, um, Word and Image, People and Practice. And I was able to spend a long time with people and really um, sort of get to know who they were and write about them. And I started publishing this blog on Twitter, on Tumblr at the same time that I did this installation in 2015 in Providence. Here's Wonton St. Louis, who's from Haiti. There's this picture. This is Wonton St. Louis and his wife, Marie, and his daughter, Shebna. And on this day, Shebna said something to me that really, as I said, like my feelings about this work has 
continues to evolve. And what Shebna said was, Mary Beth, you don't understand. This picture is how we see my father. He's a man of honor in our community. He's someone we all look up to in the Haitian community in Providence. But we also know that he's a Haitian man with a third grade education who doesn't speak very good English. And we know how he's seen in the United States. And this is the first time we've seen an image that approximates our view, our subjectivity of him, and not the American paradigm of who the, the immigrant with a third grade education is, is a man of color. And so then that was like, oh my God, I can use this work to get people to think about what their preconceptions are, to maybe notice them, to put those in conflict with how people see themselves. And because I'm working in communities and staying there for a long time, I can bring people themselves into the process of the work. And then also the the display of the work and and they can be in conversation with the viewership so i just want to go through a little bit quickly this is bedour um after you know who enacted the first travel ban i got in touch with city hall providence and said we need to do something about this muslim travel ban we took rose down rosaline who was the woman with a baby and i made this picture of bedour who was the first family her family was the first family to come to providence from the war in Syria. Uh, and this is Mayor Alorza doing a press conference saying, you know, we're a sanctuary city, we're not gonna uh, bow to this president and we honor Bedour as a human. So, okay. So next thing I know, I get a phone call from Noonan, Georgia. And it turns out that a man, I had given a talk in 2015. I'm checking the time, Glenn, don't worry. Um, I had given a talk in 2015 and a man from a small arts residency in, George, in this little town called Noonan, Georgia, called me up and said, I was in Providence. I heard you give, a talk, give that talk to the Alliance for Arts Communities. And I went on a tour and saw your banners. It was the most beautiful fall weekend you can imagine, the most gorgeous weekend. And would you be interested in coming to Noonan and doing a project? So I'm showing you this Wikipedia site because this is all, not only all I knew about Noonan, but I really didn't know that much about the South. Like I knew what any relatively well-educated Northerner knows about the South, but I had never, which is skewed, I now know, but I had never spent time there. So this was my introduction, a Wikipedia site with the history, and the demographics, and and uh, you know, my kids were a little bit older now. I'd been only working in New England. I had to sit down with them and say, "How do you feel about me and my husband? And how do you feel about me doing this project remotely?" And so I went to Noonan. and he said, "Come for an exploratory visit." This is Robert Hancock and his wife Candy, and I met them. He wrote to me in January of 2016. I went and met them in May of 2016. And then I had my first photography trip in November. And this is a woman named Cynthia Jenkins, who is the mayor pro tem. And on my first trip in November, like the nerves I have in my belly now times 10 quadrillion is how nervous I was at this football game because this was my first real photography trip. And she took me to this football game, which was um, the county, like the two high schools in Coweta County were gonna be against each other until everybody in the county was gonna be there. And I was to make pictures. And so I was like, well, how am I gonna do this? I don't know anything about the South, I don't know anybody. So we walked into the football stadium and I see these guys and this guy on the left with his cowboy hat and his flag. After the times, when the Times story ran, there were lots of comments about how is she dressing them? And, and does she have um, art? people who bring costumes and I thought oh my god I'm so steeped in the journalist tra journalistic tradition that I can't imagine that I could have ever brought costumes so this is Trent and my friend Cynthia took this picture on her phone and this is the first portrait I made in Noonan and this is the image and so from picture to picture from person to person my job was to meet people to try to understand who they were as individuals, but also to understand enough about the history, the demographics, the sociology of the place to figure out how they fit within the puzzle of Noonan. So to me, each 
community is really an ecosystem and so many forces have played upon that ecosystem like history, like immigration, like race, like economics. And so to me, all of that stuff is always alive in the present moment, just like in Brockton, just like in Providence. And then Noonan with its own trajectories of history, economics, race, migration, that each person, that each photo had to allow the person to be his or herself, to allow the person to come forward into the image and kind of interact in a transmission with the viewer, but also had to evoke a place in the community. So this isn't a census, but it has to be thorough. I knew that it had to be thorough, and I knew that people at the end needed to feel like Noonan had been at least authentically represented. So this is Brittany, her husband is a pastor. This is Jane Bass, who's great, one of her great grandfathers was a Revolutionary War soldier and one of the first to receive a land grant to go to Georgia and settle, meaning kill the Cherokee and the Creeks and um, you know, obtain that land and farm it. Rufus Smith is also one of the oldest African-American families in Noonan. This is Christina on the road to a town called Grantville outside Noonan, who believes that the Confederate flag is a symbol of hope and evolution. And I mean, it was really, you know, and I was able to write about this in the blog. I'll show you the blog where people's perceptions, um, you know, I, I understood that when I, I meant to tell you that when I first went, uh, I was worried about meeting people who I didn't agree with. Or, you know, I had always done projects about which I was quite sympathetic, whether it was immigration or Brockton. What happens if I meet someone who's a white supremacist or who has a Confederate flag? Or how do I, how do I approach that person? And what, what's my role? And my, I have a, a meditation teacher, a Buddhist teacher, who says, who said, I called her from Noonan on my first visit there. And she said, your job isn't to judge anybody. Nobody is born with any views, but people learn them and they're inculcated with them. And the, the, what we have today is the manifestation of what everyone's been taught, what they've learned and what they've inherited. And so my job was simply to figure out where people were in the moment. And that approach really served me. And I'll tell you, um, it served me, hang on, I'll tell you in a second. This is Coleman, whose father is an original founder of the town. William Banks, who's the wealthiest man in the town because his father owned the cotton mill there. Jeanette, who is a recent immigrant from Mexico. I went to Cotillion, which is where kids learn their manners. They learn how to dance and hold a fork and do the foxtrot. But I was able to ask the question, you know, this is a young man whose family has gone to Cotillion and Noonan for two generations, but this is Ariel. And how come out of 60 kids, only two of those kids are black? And why is Ariel one of them? And so I was able to talk to Ariel and meet her mom and talk about that tension of being the only black kid at Cotillion and think about those forces that led us to today. So this is, I, it, the first time I went, they, they have a little cottage and I had a little stu, a, a studio in the cottage. And this is a picture of a woman called Barbara. And I had a little show. So that first November visit, I think I did two quick visits. Over the course of three years, I've went, have gone back many, many times. And I printed these little paper prints. And here's Barbara. And I'm showing you this because when Robert, Robert Hancock and I have gotten to be very close, but the first, the person who invited me, but it's been a tense relationship. Um, I made this portrait of Barbara at her house and I found Barbara because I wanted to go to the church where I wanted to meet the descendants of the original founders of the town. And I went to that church and I met her there and I, went to her house and this is her parents house and i noticed this statue and we made this portrait early on i had said to robert look i'm in this process of writing really interviewing and spending time in writing and he said um doesn't matter nobody's going to read your blog anyway we just care about the pictures so i'm showing you this because here's barbara seeing her picture everybody was there everybody's happy with the picture here's the picture her mom sees it and says oh you've got the little black statue in there like we're able to talk about 
But then here comes the blog and here comes my long conversation with Barbara and Barbara says, I love the picture because I think it speaks about the way our country is so divided right now. And she goes on and on and she says, you've got all of these symbols and you've got the white supremacy. And I say, this picture puts you in the position of the white supremacy, Barbara. And she says, I know that and I don't like it, but that's how it is. So this picture became an opportunity for me to tease out the sort of generational attitudes about race to get Barbara to open up about where she stood in that trajectory. And what I noticed that was what my Buddhist teacher told me about approaching everybody openly, like just tell me how you got to where you are, allow these conversations to happen. What also happened was this text became a lightning rod for me and the whole board got furious and Robert called me up and I had to go down for a huge crisis visit and they accused me of calling Barbara a white supremacist and it started pushing all their buttons. So as the work went on, I had to stop publishing the blog until the banners went up because people started freaking out about these portrayals and what was I trying to say? And it reaffirmed my um, appreciation for the power of photography and for what images could do, but also for the power of sitting and listening and not taking it personally and trying to, like I, my joke is, you know, like, you can tell me you don't like my pictures or you can tell me you think I did a bad job or you can tell me you think I've got an erroneous view. Like, don't tell me if you think I look fat in this dress, then I'll collapse, but I can handle any kind of talk about photography. So like with DJ, you know, I see DJ and I think, oh my God, he's like this redneck. And I meet him and he's a Hillary supporter. And he, you know, and he was raised a Democrat. And so with the blog, I'm able to call myself out to stand in for the viewer, to say, I had this preconception of him. I ran it by him. This is what he told me. And so again, in my own evolution of understanding how photography works, I've realized that photography is a funny paradox because with it, I'm dwelling on the surfaces of things. But what I hope I'm asking a viewer to question is what gets triggered in them when they interact with that surface. And then how can words and deeper interaction and community engagement get them to shift those preconceptions, notice them, not with blame, but just with an openness to try to shift. So, you know, I'm going to show you the rest of the pictures and the installation views. And then I'd love to, um, if anyone has any questions now, this is LC who spent his life sharecropping. These are all still Noonan. Here's LC when I brought him a print in the town square. So I would stay there for long periods of time, weeks at a time, one week, two weeks, 10 days. And I would go off and it's easy to get from province to Atlanta. And then Noonan's just 40 minutes outside Atlanta. This is Cliff and Monique on this land that was discovered. It's possibly the largest uh, cemetery of enslaved Africans in the South but it's unmarked and the city was going to plow it and put walking trails through until a community member stopped them. This is Jimmy Patterson who stood up and made a public apology to the town when he discovered that his family had owned slaves. Um, it's the first time anybody has addressed anything about Noonan's history and this project isn't the only force getting people to talk about the past, but it's one of a couple of forces that are getting people to open up and try to um, embrace the past, you know, on the path to healing. This is Zara and Atika Shah, who were both born right outside Noonan. Their parents are from Pakistan, they're engineers. This is Tina. This is, um, I saw her outside her house and we made this portrait a couple of days later. Helen Berry graduated from uh, segregated high school in the class of 1954. And so she was a young woman during Jim Crow and she and her friends had a lot to tell me about those experiences. This is Wiley Driver who uh, had worked in a mill, unlike William Banks whose father owned the mill. And so exactly a year ago, March 31st, just these last, these few days, one year ago, we put these banners up. There's the courthouse square. You can see the steeple where um, slaves had been sold, cotton was sold. 
This is a picture of Brittany on the back of the college where she works, which is now uh, now a college, but it was a whites only hospital that wouldn't uh, wouldn't treat black people until the 70s. There's Trent. There's William Banks. So what I think is radical about this work. I'm interested in hearing from, from Ruben a little, a little bit about the, um, the, the, the prospect of going out into the city. I mean, the city, I know a, a couple of you are not going out, Lunara, and I don't believe Priyanka's going out, but can it? Am I hearing something? I can't hear you, Glenn. Well, it's really great that you brought up the word fearful because I kept thinking about that when we were talking about fearless photographers that, you know, um, I also teach. I teach workshops and and, um, and other things. And, you know- the, the, can, can you identify yourself, they please? Ask, you know, by aspiring street photographers is how to get over your fear. And what I find is that uh, the fear maybe never goes away. You know, like I've been doing this for a lot of years now and I feel afraid, you know, even without COVID-19 happening, I feel afraid. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the first remark. Oh, I don't know where we are now. Well, why don't you just continue, Meredith? Okay, okay, sorry. I'm sorry I missed all that. Um, what I wanted to say was that, uh, and I'm almost done here. Um, to me, what's radical about this work is that the dominant narratives of places, the way they are always built around who gets to be the speaker, that this work allows the mill owner and the mill worker to be prominently displayed on the same level in the, in the space in which they inhabit, toward which they've contributed their lives. And so here's Helen Berry in the town square across from two, Confederate monuments that are still in uh, Newton Center. Here's Janine on the back of a church. This municipal building was off limits to blacks. This is Ariel from Cotillion. And then I, these are all around the town square in Noonan. They're on the road, Cliff and Monique are on the road to the cemetery. I want to end with this picture because um, even though I, you know, we had a lot of fights along the way, there was a lot of drama around the picture of Barbara, a lot of drama that I had to go through being accused of racializing things or bringing up the past. This picture really set off a firestorm when it was first installed. And I just want to end by showing you a little bit of the, this is the Facebook, uh, correspondence that blew up after that picture was installed. Here, this man who's little, uh, what do you call it? Bitmoji is Trump 2020, uh, you know, he really insulting to Muslims. And then, you know, the artist has an agenda. They went trolling through my old posts. This is a project I did with the RISD Museum about Islam. It says that I have an agenda but then this woman comes in and says, so spreading open arms and tolerance the diff to beliefs and ideals that differ from ours might be an agenda, but don't let it fool you. I'm not going to read it because they're all full of swears, but it's kind of, um, it was kind of amazing. So this one says, here's her, this is literally the agenda, clear as day, how evil, truly disturbing how she wants to bring people together through art so we can try to better understand one another. So, you know, I sat on my thumbs um, while this was happening and I didn't, I didn't interact with the Facebook, but I watched it. Oh, sorry. This one, Piggly Wiggly, I mean, it got really, it had the same vibe that you could imagine the lynch mom having of a hundred years before. You know, it was just sort of angry and ugly. Uh, there's a really violent one that I didn't uh, put here. Um, but then people are saying, I'm talking about meeting people, forming meaningful bonds. I mean, so people really did, this one post had 1.1 thousand comments. Uh, they're talking about Native Americans by white, you know, killing by white people. They're talking about race. 
And then this is my favorite, and I just want to end with this. I just want to say, she says, Jesus was almost certainly brown. These women are your neighbors. You've perpetuated the stereotypes that led to this installment in the first place. Don't be so quick to assume you know everything. Loving others and accepting our fellow human beings who may be different is not leftist. It's not political. It's human. It's progressive. It's the future. And we're excited to leave those who disagree behind. So I can't imagine a better, um, I feel like I want to write to her and say, can this be my artist statement? And I'll attribute it to you. So that's the work and it's still there. Um, it was supposed to just be up for a year and we're trying, they're thinking about extending it until the summer. And I hope I didn't speak too long and I'd be no. happy to uh, take any questions or hear comments. Or well, thank you, Mary Beth. That, that was an amazing presentation. I, I really commend you for wading in the swamp of race and class in the South to do this very powerful work. Um, I mean, even if the pictures weren't blown up to 40 feet wide, and even if you weren't dealing with these important issues, there's just extraordinary images, each one of them, just as portraits of people. So, really Thanks. amazing work. And I, I would like to just ask one question to start, and mm -hmm. it, it's sort of a non sequitur in terms of what you're talking about. But I noticed in the New York Times, you weren't the photographer who did the installation shots. And I'm wondering why the, the Times sent somebody else down there to photograph this rather than using your wonderful installation photos. Yeah, and as my mother says, why do they have his picture? Why did they have his name under the picture on the front page and not <laughs> yours name under the picture? I can't answer that. I can't answer that, Glenn. I wish uh, you can't. I can't uh, do a cup half empty with that one, even though I'm tempted to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so let's open it up to other questions. I'm sorry that this has to be like an elementary school where you need to raise your hands, but um, this is all new technology. So um, if people want to just raise your hands, I'll call on you. And again, you could raise your hands in the, um, by clicking on the participant button at the bottom and you'll see a tool to raise your hand. So let's see if there are any questions out there for Mary Beth. And if I go on speaker view, I'll see the person talking? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Kathleen Dreyer, uh, yeah. Thank Kathleen? You. Thank you. Uh, Mary Beth, beautiful work. Uh, I just very, very touched by it. Um, as, as I'm always very curious about how projects like this get funded, I'm also curious, you know, like how much time you spent away from your family. Mm -hmm. um, during this project and uh, you know just things like that um like what will happen to the mm -hmm. uh the art on the buildings uh the portraits when they're done will they go to the person that's the portrait of you know i'm curious about kind of some of the housekeeping aspects of of this project too thank okay. you thank you thank you kathleen um so robert hancock who wrote to me manages a fund and it is a, a trust and it's a trust for art and he basically gets to do what he wants with it and part of that fund funds the part of it funds the noonan arts residency that first invited me there after the fight about barbara though they kind of kicked me out then they said we don't want to fund this controversial work and so robert took the money and funneled it through the university of west georgia so that we could keep the project going. So what it required was someone on the ground who was super committed, who had access to the money. And he found a way, you know, he found a way to make it happen. Um, I, I guess I want to say, in terms of the housekeeping, you can't just do a project like this and then go put it up in a town. You know, there's so much buy-in that needs to be developed and if we had longer I would have loved to have talked about that process I mean so while I'm making the pictures and bringing them back here Michelle McDonald who many of you may know who's also an old friend uh, worked with me to edit she edit she helps me edit everything so while I'm in Providence editing Robert was down there hustling to get the building owners hustling to get people to agree to give their wall. He showed them, there's a little video that the RISD Museum did of my installation in Providence. He showed, he went around with a, a portfolio box and a, in the video and he showed it to everybody and said, look what this work does. Look what we can do here in Noonan. We put up two banners early so that 
building owners could see a prototype and drive, but we put them on the back of the college, those two that were on the, the one of Brittany and then another one, so that building owners could see them and decide whether they wanted to buy in. I mean, at the last minute, the woman, the building that had Helen Berry on the town square, I knew she had to be on the town square. It was really important to me. Pulled out at the last minute and said, this project's too controversial. I don't want. And so Robert had to go hustle two weeks Two weeks before the installers, the pictures were being printed in Brockton. I work with a, a lab still in Brockton and we had no building for Mrs. Berry. And so he hustled to make sure she was on the square. So having um, a really committed stakeholder there in town is just essential. In terms of where they're gonna go, Tina in the bikini, there's been a lot of flap about that picture. A lot of people have called City Hall and complained about her, to which I say, if she were 20 in that bikini, I don't think anybody would be complaining. But um, she says, I don't care if they hate my picture. In fact, when it comes down, I'm gonna put it on the side of my house. So some people have said they want their banners. I, you know, for a long time, I don't know if anybody on this call can help me with this idea, but when I go to Mass Mocha, those huge outdoor spaces, I would love to see some of them from other projects. They're all in storage in Brockton, all the Brockton ones, all the Providence ones, and now I don't know what's going to happen with these. We haven't talked about what's going to happen with these. So, I mean, I'd love to see them displayed together, or some of them, or a selection of them, but but they're owned by Noonan and Noonan will decide what they want to do with them. Did I answer all your questions? Okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead, Eric. Oh, it's me. Hi. Um, thank you for this project. It's wonderful. Um, I, and, and I can only imagine the layered, uh, processes that you went through to get where you did. So congratulations. Um, my question is, was there opportunities for racial justice education as a result? Was there any specific educational programming put in place? Well, um, in fact, um, that's part of a longer, so during the time that I was there, the neo-Nazis that had gone to Charlottesville also went to Noonan and held a rally there. I think the Times thing touched on that a little bit. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, and that started a series of interfaith dialogue meetings that um, people were coming together. And that was the first time when I said Jimmy Patterson stood up and talked about his, his ancestors having owned slaves that were spurred on by the neo-Nazis coming, but I had already been working there for almost two years. So we kind of like got in the, sim uh, in the same stream together. There was this motion already in the town to start dealing with the past. Mm -hmm. um, we, so we had uh, opening celebrations. What's happening? A cat. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, that's okay. I don't have a cat. Um, so, Last weekend, the Presbyterian Church was holding a huge event about the pictures and about how we see one another and mm -hmm. how God says uh, we must treat our neighbors as ourselves. The Presbyterian Church hosted two banners, and so the pastor had to go through this whole rigmarole with the worshipers because some of the older rich white ladies were like, we don't want that poor mill worker on our church. And the pastor was like, hang on a minute, didn't Jesus say all are welcome? So like in small and big ways, things have happened. Someone told me that they went through the drive through at the bank and the bank teller is right across from one of the banners. And the bank teller said we had to have diversity training. Because <laughs> so many people were coming through the teller going, what are these pictures all about? So unfortunately, the big thing at the Presbyterian Church last weekend was, of course, canceled due to COVID. Mm. And um, there's a festival in June, so we're not we're not quite we're not quite sure what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes and no, I guess is the answer. Yeah, mm -hmm. what what could happen, and it'll percolate. I hope so. I hope I hope it's percolating. Mm -hmm. Thank you. See, I see you had your hand up. Uh, do you have a question? Hi. Uh, actually, hi, Mary Beth. Hi, C. We can't seem to meet in person, but we can now we can do it with everybody else. Um, so the previous person, I'm sorry, I don't know what your name, just answered my question. So I don't, that's why I put my hand down. 
<laughs> Thank you. All right. All right, I see somebody with their hand up, but their name comes across as a string of letters with an X. Is X here? I hope it's not that guy from Facebook. <laughs> um, X. Um, does anybody know they have their hand up? All right, any other questions then? Um, yeah, Glenn, this is Kate Way. Hey, oh. I don't. I don't think mine is, I'm on audio only, sorry. Oh, okay, Kate, yeah, go ahead. I don't think I'm the X, um, but I just have a question. Thank you so much for this beautiful work. And I just have a question about, um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit just about technically your process in making such large prints and you know what you were sh shooting with and what your printing process was and, and hanging those, you know, those enormous prints in, in public spaces. And um, I'd love to hear more about that. Sure. Um, so in Providence and in, in Brockton, and then early on in Providence, I was working with six by seven film. So medium format film and having it uh, processed and scanned. And I was kind of going broke getting things processed and scanned. Um, and so I, saved up and got the Nikon D800. And so since then I've been working in that series. I think I have the second one now. I don't remember which, I'm not very big on all that stuff. I have one camera and a 35 millimeter lens and a 50 millimeter lens. And I, I don't use a lot of light. Um, in terms of the photography, you know, it's such a, sometimes I would meet a person and we would spend hours and hours talking or we would go and eat or we would, and then we would be so exhausted by the end, I'd have to go the next day or another day because I really wanted to figure out like who this person was, you know, like figure out like where do they fit and what is it about them that grabs me? So, um, you know, it would be pretty simple, just me and them and the camera and trying to breathe and get connected and get to a moment where an authentic picture would happen. And Michelle McDonald is so great because she, some of you know her, she would be like, no, 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 no. Yep, this one, this one. So like how to find one that has a kind of emotional presence that is formally has a kind of beauty or has a kind of formal quality that will draw a viewer in. Like I feel, you know, that stuff's really important. Then in terms of the, um, in terms of the printing, I met a guy named Ron Farino at Sign Design in Brockton when I did the Brockton installation. And he has been, they do uh, the Patriots, they do Fenway Park, they do mass art, they do signage. But lo and behold, there's a guy in the printing who's like an old artist, old photographer, and he and I got into this zone of doing the color corrections and the tweaking, and he makes these vinyl banners that are just so, they're perfect prints. I mean, they're just really, really great. So now the picture, the files come right out of the Nikon D800. I work on them in Photoshop, tweak them, and then I send them to Brockton for proofs. We proof the image, tweak the, tweak the files until I get a vinyl proof that's perfect. Sometimes we go, you know, like one that's this big. And then he'll do one that's to scale. So like maybe an eyeball will be this big. Then meanwhile, we, I photograph all the buildings. We have to measure the buildings. I have to, I, in Photoshop, I lay the image onto the building to figure out what it, what it would look like by the eyeballs, you know, just on screen. How big would this look? How great would this look this big? Then we measure that then sign design has to measure that. And then they send me layouts. So it's back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And once I know that they have the layout and the dimensions correct, that I have a proof that's perfect, we know we're working from the same file. Then they print the banner, hem it, and gr put grommets, and then they shipped them all to Georgia. And then we subcontracted a, a, an installer down there to put them up. And I, I just hope, I just texted Ron the other day to make sure they were all fine. And I mean, I just, he, I can't tell you how much I love him and that business. And I'm so glad all that money goes to Brockton. And it's been a wonderful, a wonderful partnership. Did I answer everything? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Mary Beth, how long can those images stay up out in the open like that before they start to deteriorate? Well, the Brockton ones were up for like three, almost three years. 
And they, um, you know, through the wind and I mean, they started to get a little tatter by the end. Uh, Providence, there are still three up from 2018. You know, it's getting to be time to take them down, but they're not really faded. I mean, unless the sun is really on them directly all day long, they they look great. I mean, they really look good. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, Mary Beth. That, that was fantastic. Everybody. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, normally at Doc Matters, we take a break and have some wine and cheese and um, take a bathroom break. The, the, the bathrooms are down the hall on the left if anybody uh, needs to use them. And But um, we'll go right into our next speaker, which is um, Coco McCabe, a photographer based in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Um, as a longtime story gatherer for Oxfam America, She's photographed people in impoverished communities in Africa, East Asia, and Central America. More recently, she's focused on landscapes, street photography, and special projects, such as documenting the threats to New England's magnificent coastal marshes. And the project she will present tonight is titled Clam Town. Clam Town. Hey, Coco. Great, hi. So first, can you hear me, everybody? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Now I'm going to go to Sheen screen share and try to find my PowerPoint. One second. I think I can get rid of that. No, screen share. Share screen. Oh, maybe I go here. Yes. Okay, one sec. Beautiful picture. <laughs> it's not mine. Came, came with the computer. All right, now I'm going to hear. Okay, great. So I'll start by um, telling you a little bit about myself and then uh, move into the project. So um, first of all, Glenn, I wanna thank you so much for setting all of this up with this technology. It's amazing that we can all be meeting here uh, virtually like this. And I think we're all learning as we go, but it's great. And it's a great way to stay in touch with families. And I've been so happy to have this. And I'm happy to be here with you tonight, too. So um, I first started taking pictures seriously about eight years ago when my mother died. I don't know what compelled me to pick up the camera, but, but I did. Um, but my interest actually goes back many decades to when I was a newspaper reporter in a small town here, actually in Ipswich. And one of the jobs of a reporter back then was to also take pictures that go with the stories. And the paper was run by a pretty tight-fisted guy who was very careful with how much film we used. So even though I really enjoyed the photography part of my job, I was scared to death of it because I was afraid to use the film. He was so tight-fisted. Um, so jump ahead 20 years and I'm at Oxfam where I am working in the communications department and the job there was to basically tell the story of Oxfam's work and very important to that was the photography because that is how we helped build empathy between the donors and the people who we were trying to help. And in the beginning, I traveled a lot with professional photographers. I think one might even be on the call right now, Eileen Perlman. I was with her in Guatemala and other places. Um, but over time, I started bringing a camera with me. And toward the end of my tenure at Oxfam, I was taking the photographs that ran with the stories that I was writing. So I, I was really doing both jobs. And I really enjoyed the photography much more at that point than the writing. So now I'm retired and here I am in Ipswich and I'm going to start showing you. So Ipswich has a nickname, which is Clam Town. And it's one of the very oldest communities um, in, in the country. It was started in 1634. It's about an hour north of Boston on, on the um, Atlantic coast. And uh, clamming has been one of its oldest economic enterprises. Clamming really is mostly about mud. Um, 
it's everywhere and it's black and it's sticky and you step in it and your shoes get sucked off. Sometimes it's really stinky, but clams love it. <laughs> and this is the Ipswich River. At low tide, it's just one big bed of mud. My house is up on the right hand side of this picture and to the far left is a channel that always has enough water in it for the clammers and other boaters to come up and down. And at the top of the picture around the bend is the town wharf, which is where many clammers put, put in, meaning they drive their boats on their trailers, back them in when there's enough water and head out. So this guy has just come back. You can see it's the dead of winter. He's sloshing through ice and that boat has nothing to do with clamming except that it transports him to where the flats are. And he's carrying his bags and there's a truck there. Every clammer has a truck, not every clammer has a boat. And so question is, who are these clammers? Well, they are a solitary group. Um, they're loners, they're independent often. They are, um, private people, they are suspicious of outsiders. I was definitely an outsider. And in the age of coronavirus, you would think, wow, this is a perfect kind of job for, for people to do because you know social distancing is easy. But in fact, the markets for their clams have all shut down. So a lot of these clamors right now are not working and, and it's a real hardship for people. And in the past, when flats have closed, the state government has stepped in and helped clamors with, with a little bit of support. I don't think the state is there yet for this particular circumstance, but in the past when there have been things like red tide, um, which gives the, the clams a, um, a poison and is very dangerous to people, clamors have been out of work for a long time and they've gotten some assistance. Um, so most of the clamors are men who happen to be pretty dismissive of women. And um, I knew when I started this project that I'd have to have a pretty thick skin to make any headway. I knew that I'd have to take some ribbing, that I'd have to be ignored, that I'd really have to insert myself and be a little pushy. So my approach was to start by hanging around the landings where the clammers put their boats in. There's several around town. And I would watch, my camera was obvious. I'd say hello, and they'd say, oh, here comes a lady with the camera, that kind of thing. Um, but slowly I began to learn a little bit about them. And uh, I would get the names of some and not much further than that. So this guy, Ross Adams, I learned, happened to be one of the, or happens to be one of the most prolific clamors in Ipswich. He digs volumes, but, he, he never slowed down long enough for me to actually talk to him. This guy is Ed Hetner, and some of the flats you can reach by um, just walking from the road, you, you troop out quite a distance. So I saw a man bent over out in the flat one day and I walked out and it was him. He turned out to be quite friendly. We turned out to be the same age, 63. So we had that in common. And I was impressed that he was still out there doing this very hard physical work at his age. This guy is, um, uh, what was his name? It's Paul Damon. And he was all business, happy to have me take his photograph, but no time to stop and talk. And then this guy is a different story. He was a little difficult. Um, I saw him, I was at my house in my kitchen looking out the window and I noticed the clamors were out. So I jumped in the car, went around to where they were and trooped out into the flat. He didn't mind me taking his picture. He was perfectly happy about it. He had a few buddies around. They were shouting and kind of joking around and all was fine until I asked him what his name was. And he said, Mike Hunt, but I don't really think that was his name. So that's the kind of sort of to and fro I had to go with with some of these guys. Um, so 
though clamming attracts an independent crowd, they are the kind of people who can't often easily work in other places. You know, they wouldn't do well in offices, um, having endless conference calls, being told what to do, none of that stuff. They're definitely independent and they also have some troubles. So among the younger generation of clamors, drug addiction these days is a bit of a problem. Um, and what feeds it is that clamming can be easy money. On, on a tide, if you are a good clamor, you can earn two, three, four hundred dollars in a few hours of work. And, and you can sell those clams right away and then use that money to buy your drugs. So a number of the people I talked to were recovering addicts or fighting the problem as, as we spoke. And I remember one day I was at the flats hoping to, to actually go out with someone and take photographs. And I wound up talking to this man who told me his entire life story. Um, of sexual abuse as a child and how drug addiction ran through his family, how he had become drug addicted. By the time, you know, we finished talking, the tide had come and gone. He'd missed his digging, but I felt like he had really wanted to tell me his story and I felt like I needed to listen. And I was really actually very grateful for, for that insight and opportunity. So most of the clamors are men, but there are a very few handful of women. This is one of them, Brenda Turner. And I asked if I could go out with her and eventually she said yes, but I really had to chase her. Lots of phone calls, lots of text messages, lots of false starts. She was hesitant, but finally let me come along on the provision that I make sure I was properly attired because out in the winter on the flats, it can be, bitter. And so I realized what I needed to get was a pair of waders. I had a, a pair of old boots that went up to my knees, but they would have been useless in the mud. Um, so these waders were really one of the best things I've ever bought. You, I rolled around in the mud in them. I waded in the water up to my waist. Um, they're warm. They're made out of that stuff that wetsuits are made out of. And so the day I went out with Brenda, I was really glad to have them because this is a typical digging day in New England in the winter. It was wet and windy and snowing, and it was pretty miserable. And we were out there for about three hours. She was digging razor clams, which are these longer, skinny clams. They're about the size of two fingers put together. And the market for them is good or the price for them is good. You can get five to seven dollars a pound for the steamer or for the razors. Um, but they're tricky to dig. They have a little tongue and if they feel you coming they sort of pull themselves deep into the mud. And the other thing about them is you don't want them broken. So you really have to be pretty careful and it's pretty hard work. So besides waders, the tools that you need to be a clamor are a rake, like this guy has, and a, a basket, and a, a clamming permit, a commercial permit. And in Ipswich, those permits cost $450 a year. But if you're a good clamor, you can pay that back in a day. Clamors also need boats. Um, most of them have metal skiffs with little motors, and they often go out in pairs. This man had a canoe. People were making a lot of fun of him because he he was kind of doing it his own way in his canoe. And sometimes the wind whips up and that canoe is not very stable, but he always seemed to make it back. What I want to point out to you though is what he's got on his head, which is this a net. And this picture was taken in the summertime. And as cold and miserable as clamming is in the winter, clamming in the summer can be really brutal because of the bugs. And it's, it's, we have three different kinds. We have mosquitoes, which everyone knows about. In July, we get these things called greenheads, which are big flies and they land fierce bite and a big welt and they really itch. But the worst of all the bugs are these little black things called noceums and they come in swarms and they attack. And you can put bug spray on, you can put clothes on, you can wear these nets. None of it makes any difference. You just get eaten. And if you have an allergy to these bugs, you can't be a clamor. So that's one of the miseries of, of this kind of work. 
Um, and there's a third absolute in Clamor's lives, along with mud and bugs, and that's the tide. So Clamor's can only dig at low tide because that's when the water is gone. Um, and that means you never work at the same time each day. Uh, sometimes the tide is low early in the morning, sometimes it's low at the end of the day. You're also not allowed to dig in the dark. So if the tide happens to be low in the morning, climbers get to the landings way before dawn to get their gear ready so they can be out at the flats the moment the light is right and start digging. Um, and as soon as you're there on the flats, you don't want to waste a minute because the tides come in fast. And around here, it's often a 10 foot tide, sometimes more. And so you have a, a few hours to do your work. And in that few hours, you're bent over like this, digging, probably pulling up in the course of a lifetime, tons of mud. You have to be careful not to crush the clams. They're called soft shell clams. And even though the shell looks hard to us, it's, it, it, you can break it very easily. So you have to pull up this mud, pull the clam apart, put it in your basket, and do all of this as quickly as you can. This guy had the company of his dog. I don't know if the dog was helping much, but he really enjoyed having him around. Um, and then soon after, you know, the tide comes in. When he arrived at the flat, that boat was parked in the mud. A few hours later, it, it's floating, and if he'd waited much longer, he would have had to swim back to the boat. He's carrying his clams in sacks that are made out of uh, kind of a mesh, so he can drag them in the water and wash the mud off. So the next stop after you get back, many clamors return to the town wharf, where there's often a truck from uh, a Boston buyer. It's, it's Red's Best is the name of the buyer. And clamors from other towns, Essex and Rowley, also come to the town wharf here to sell to this guy or to Red's best. And this is one of the clamors on Jeff Thomas. And he's rubbing his hands here. He's been out for several hours. And he said his hands were just really cold. And even though you wear multiple layers and cl clamors often wear gloves in the winter, it's still really freezing. Um, so the next stop in the life of the clam is to the shuckers. And um, the day I visited this, this shucking shack, uh, there were about eight people working there. And this was a little company that was started years ago by a bunch of clamming brothers. So the, the day that I went, there were mostly immigrants working there, a few family members, and then this guy, Richard Hazen, who's an Ipswich resident, and this has been his profession for decades. He, he's a shucker. And they, they were telling me that the reason um, so few people do it nowadays and, and they rely on immigrant labor is because it's kind of yucky work. And you can see you've got to be quick with a knife and have your hands in goo for hours. And uh, most shuckers can do about a gallon an hour. Um, and you sit at a long table and you work over a hole and, and the shells drop down a funnel and then the clams get dropped into a little bucket on the side. And many of them are destined for this place, which is Ipswich's very famous clam box, famous as much for its food as for its architecture. And in the summertime, um, people line up outside this place to get their, their hit of fat and and fried seafood. Um, and communities around here are, uh, compete with each other to, to you know, say who has the best clam. And of course, Ipswich and his clam box thinks it, it does. Here's the chef inside um, using their magic batter to, to, before, to toss the clams before he fries them. And, and as I was looking at this picture, it occurred to me every step of the way, this clamming is a messy business, you know, from the digging to the shucking to the cooking. It's all messy, but the end result is just delicious. People love these fried clams. Um, and the irony in all of this project for me is that even though these look so good, I can't eat clams. I'm terribly allergic. 
Uh, but regardless of that, it's everything about clamming is, is what I love. And, and not the least the landscape um, here in Ipswich. And <clears throat> it looks like it does today as it did a thousand years ago when Native Americans were here clamming and leaving their clam shells. And um, it's all part of the Great Marsh system, which I've also been interested in photographing. So there you are. <laughs> and if anyone has any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Edward Bochies, I see your hand up. Yes, Coco. Um, I've seen your pictures, as you know. Yeah. I've admired them for many years, but this is the first time I've heard you present, and you are an, I just want to say you're an absolutely magnificent uh, storyteller and, and presenter, and I set him mesmerized uh, the whole time, as did my wife, Barbara. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. Edward, you're funny. Thank you. That's all. I'm not <laughs> and somebody, John has their hand up. Oh, hi, Coco. Um, yeah, great work. Um, I've actually shot this down on the Cape, these kind yeah. of people. I have two questions for you. Um, yeah. When you were approaching your subjects, did you have a story, like, I always found it easier, or maybe that's part of the fear that we always talk about or how uncomfortable it is. I always like to have a story. So I have a reason that I'm not, I always feel like it makes it a little easier to get into their lives. Do you do that or did you have uh, that sort of entree into the- No, my, my approach, I wasn't sure what I was doing when I started and it was very simple. I just said, you know, or, um, that I was working on a project and I wasn't sure exactly where it was going to go, but I, I had hoped that it, I hoped that it was going to materialize into something that would appear somewhere. That's all I said. But having been a reporter for many years, I, was used to you know approaching all kinds of people all the time and just being rebuffed and and going back and being rebuffed again and it's just something you do but i also found as soon as you get people one on one when they're away from the crowd when they don't have to show off when they can be who they are much more willing to engage and and um let you into their lives and in fact people were turned out to be really good to me. And the thing that, um, my, my, my favorite thing was I got a message from one of the clamors who took me far away into Rowley and we spent the afternoon, he wrote to me after I sent him the pictures and he said, you've got a lifetime pass on my boat. So I thought, yes, I did the right thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I find that people, when you ask them questions, if you are interested in them, they, they open up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Uh, my second question, I'm always curious about this, um, your choice to shoot it in black and white. Yeah. Why? Well, so I feel like clamming is a very, very old enterprise, and I felt like the black and white pictures sort of honored that history a little bit. And also the landscape here, particularly in the winter, it's almost black and white when it's snowing anyway. Uh, it's often foggy, the mud is black, the snow is white, the clothes that people wear are dark, their, their boots are dark, the clams are black and white, almost. So I felt like it added strength to the series to have it in black and white. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sure. How long have you been working on this project, Coco? Well, I, I spent uh, about a year on it, and I'm, I've done, done it now, I think, yeah. Do you have any plans to go further with the presentation of the work, exhibitions, publications? Oh, uh, well, I reached out to um, a gallery here in town that's at a local company called EBSCO. I haven't, um, not EBSCO, Biolabs. I haven't done any, anything more about it than that, except for you guys. Well, they deserve to be seen. They're really beautiful photos. And it's, it's an amazing story. Yeah, really fun to do.
Are, are clams like oysters? Um, like, do people have beds or is it just a free for all? They can go wherever they want. Well, no, it's very highly regulated and you can't go wherever you want. And uh, in Ipswich, there's a flat for the um, recreational diggers that the commercial diggers are not allowed to go on to. And then there are all these other flats. There's a whole map of where you can go and can't go. And day by day, it changes. And if there's rain, all the flats are closed because what happens is pollution from everyone's septic systems, from the roads, everything all washes into the mud and into the clams. So they shut everything down for several days after a rainstorm, which makes it really difficult for clammers because if, if that's your only work, then you're out of work for those days. Mm. Any other questions out there? Mary Beth? Kristen, I don't know where the hand up thing is. Hi, Carl. <laughs> Hi, Mary Beth. Oh, beautiful. Um, do you have any interest in like, I know this is sort of, I don't know if this is off your path, but like going home, like where they live. I'm so curious, like where do they live? Do they, is that part of your? That, I definitely wanted to do that. But I have to tell you, I began to get a little depressed about the clamors and about the quality of their lives. And, and then at, the more I learned about the drug addiction, I felt like I just needed to take a break from it. Mm -hmm. So my original plan was to try to get into their homes and see how they lived. But I, I didn't have the energy to give that emotional investment into that. Yeah, it's understandable. Yeah, I just couldn't. And maybe someday, maybe someday I will. But well, it's beautiful it's as is. It doesn't need it. You know, it's just got its own beauty. So well, it would have been a, a, a different project and, and maybe someday that will be part two. Got it. <laughs> Tony, I see you got your hand up. Uh, you need to unmute. Tony? Can you hear me? Can hear you now, yeah. Okay, good, good. Coco, I just wanted to tell you that your images are just spectacular. I have a familiarity with that area where, you know, the clam diggers work and uh, you've just done a great service to uh, those people by bringing a story forward as well. Excellent, thank you, I love it. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> there is a uh, question in the chat here. Um, yeah. Coco, can you share what you believe your gifts are that enable you to establish these relationships? By Cindy Murray. Oh boy, well, first, I think the most important thing is I have a really keen interest in what they were doing. So as I mentioned, I live right here on the Ipswich River which is their thoroughfare and morning and night, I hear the chug, chug, chug of their motors. And then I go right to the window because I like to see them come by. I don't know why, it's sort of like, I just love the life of the river. Um, and I really respect what they do. It's a hard work, it's physical work, it feeds us, it's independent work. Um, there's just something very earthy and honest about it. So I love, I love all of that. Um, and I feel like I'm a good listener. So I think that helps. Um, I don't like, I don't have a thick skin. I'm thin skinned and when I get, get brushed off, it hurts my feelings, but I try, I keep trying. I guess that's it. You know, you always have to keep trying. And I think that's key, don't give up. And I know I just said to Mary Beth, I didn't have the stomach to keep pursuing it. Someday I might, but it, it is emotionally draining to enter deeply into people's lives. And I'm sure Mary Beth knows that from having done the work that she's done. Um, I think listening is key, very key. And being patient is important too. So. Those are all good lessons about taking good photographs across the board. With yeah. It's draining, but it's also very enriching. Yeah. Susan Ressler, got a question there. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to thank both speakers, the really wonderful presentations, and uh, really enjoyed the work. And 
to um, before I forget, I'm I'm wondering, are you going to send us some kind of resources, online resources, so we can see more of their work? That's my first question. And then I just want to make a comment in to relate back to the other person who asked about why black and white with Coco. Uh, Coco, your work uh, reminds me a lot of P.H. Emerson, the 19th century photographer. And if you don't know his work, I, I think you might really uh, enjoy it. He, he photographed the fishers, fisher folk of East Anglia, uh, England. <laughs> and if you if you just go online and uh, uh, you can and Google P. H. Emerson and look at images, you'll see what I mean. Okay, great. I just wrote his name down. Thank you very much. I will do that. Yeah, I remember those pictures from photo history many years ago. They're really beautiful photos. Yeah. Hey, any other questions? If not, let me thank our presenters, uh, Mary Beth and Coco, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this is our first time doing this, and I think it went extremely well. We look forward to having future ones, so stay posted um, for future announcements. And um, we actually do have one coming up soon. We'll be sending that information fairly soon once we um, get everything squared away with that. And we will be posting the video of this on our website within a few days. So thank you, everybody, and signing off. Thanks, Glenn. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks for coming, Bye. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Coco. <laughs> Great work, Coco. Great work. Thank you, Lee. Excellent Thanks so job. much. That was wonderful. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.